قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد نصركم الله ببدر وأنتم أذلة فاتقوا الله لعلكم تشكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم Today is the 17th of the month of Ramadan A day that witnessed exactly 1,436 years ago, 1,436 years ago, this day, the 17th of Ramadan, witnessed the first defensive battle in Islam, very first one, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, defended the integrity of his community in the battle called Badr, Waqi'atu Badr, or Waqa'atu Badr, or Ghazwatu Badr, or Ma'arakatu Badr. All these names are similar. It means the battle of Badr. Tonight we learn few things about the life and the legacy and the tradition of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We learn few things about his life through this battle, the preparation for it, and the battle itself, and the aftermath of this battle. This battle has been mentioned in the Quran in a few chapters. In chapter 3, Surah Al-Imran, the family of Imran, which is the family of Mary. And in chapter number 8, Surah Al-Anfal, the war spoils, also speaks about the battle of birth. This battle took place in the second year of the Hijrah. Now, what year is it now? Who knows? 1,438. So it took place in the year 2. As I said, 1,436 years ago. And it was the very first major battle that took place defending the city of Medina and the newly established Muslim community in the city of Medina against the aggression of Quraysh and the arrogance of their enemies Quraysh. Quraysh being in Mecca. Quraysh is the tribe of the Prophet himself who did not accept his invitation out of arrogance because Prophet Muhammad was not the richest. He was not wealthy. They thought that the messenger of God, whoever God sends to the humanity, should be millionaire. He should be wealthy. If he does not have money, then he doesn't have influence. Then we are not going to listen to him. So out of prejudice, out of bigotry and arrogance, they rejected the invitation of the Prophet And they turned against him. They turned against him. When the Prophet was in Mecca preaching the word of God, inviting them to the right path, they persecuted him. They chased him. They tortured him and his followers. They confiscated 
whoever would turn to the side of the Prophet and join him, his property, his land would be confiscated. His money will be taken away. So many of those Muslims were driven out of their land, out of their homes. They were persecuted by Quraysh. Some of them, however, remained in Mecca. They could not travel to Medina because of family ties. They had families. They could not leave them. And for other reasons, they could not move from Mecca to Medina. But many Muslims, they moved with the Prophet. When he moved to Medina, they moved with him to this new city that welcomed the Prophet. You know, Quraysh, they had two trips, two business trips, two major business trips. One, in the summertime, they take their goods to Syria to sell them in Syria, to the north. The other one was in the, in the winter time, where they take their goods to, to the south, to Yemen, and they sell their goods, they purchase new goods, and they come back to Mecca. Two trips, two business trips, winter trip and summer trip. The Ilafi Quraishim, Ilafi Imrihlat al Shita'i, Wasayf, the trip, the journey of the winter and the summer. In this winter trip, Quraysh invested all their money in this caravan. And the caravan was headed by Sakhar ibn Harb. Sakhar ibn Harb is the real name of Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan, his real name is Sakhar. Sakhar is stone and Harb is war. So the stone of the war. This is his the translation of his meaning, as his name. So they put all their money in that, they invested all their money in that caravan that would go from Mecca to Syria. Every single person in Mecca who had money, they would invest that money in this caravan. And he took it to Syria on the way back, on the way back, they, he has to pass it through Medina. Because Medina is in the middle between Mecca and Syria. Medina is in the middle. So the Prophet realized that this caravan is coming back. And the entire economy and the entire wealth of Quraysh is in this caravan. So the Prophet wanted to send a warning, a strong message to Quraysh that if you keep persecuting the Muslims, and if, if you keep harassing us and torturing the Muslims, then your economy will be in danger. Your caravan would not be safe. Your wealth is going to be confiscated. And you will be under embargo. And you know, any country, when you put any country under embargo, economic embargo, that country will kneel down. So the Prophet sent a message to Quraysh. And he said to his community, let's go outside Medina and intercept this caravan. If we get it, we will get it and put our hand on that caravan and we will confiscate it from Quraysh because they already confiscated, the Quraysh had confiscated the wealth, the properties of the new Muslims in Mecca. And if we don't, then we send at least a powerful message to the arrogant Meccans. Because those people in Mecca, Quraysh, their arrogance was based on their wealth, on their money. Once you take the money away from them, they crumble down, like some countries today in the Middle East. Take the oil away from them, the money, the second day, nobody can survive. The same story happened 1400 years ago. Same people. So the people, the community of Medina who were with the Prophet, many of them were poor. And some of them were interested in the caravan. They are poor. And if they can seize this caravan and take the wealth away, Definitely, they're going to be better off. 
And this is what God says to his prophet. The details of this battle is mentioned in chapter 8, Surah Al-Anfal. Beautiful chapter. The details of this war, before the war, during the war, and after the war is mentioned in chapter number 8. وَإِذْ يَعِدِكُمُ اللَّهِ Hence, your Lord promised you إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ Two things. طَائِفَة means thing or a group. Either you're going to get the caravan, you're going to seize it for you, which is a success, or you defeat Quraysh militarily. Again, this is another success. إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ Either the seizure of the caravan, Either you break down economically or you defeat them militarily. So these two, God promised you. If you don't get the first one, definitely you're going to get the second one. It's going to be of yours. What they were doing, but God knows about their hearts. Those who were around the Prophet, they wanted money. Free money. They didn't want to fight. وَتَوَدُّونَ أَنَّ غَيْرَ ذَاتِ الشَّوْكَةِ تَكُونُ لَكُمْ وَيُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُحِقَّ الْحَقَّ بِكَلِمَاتِهِ وَيَقْطَعَ دَابِرَ الْكَافِرِينَ God knows about your hearts. He wants to get the spoil of the war. He wants to get the booties. He wants to get the money without getting involved in any fight. But God determines to establish the truth and and defeats falsehood so they went with the prophet and it was on the eighth day of ramadan day number eight in ramadan and remember this is the very first ramadan muslims are fasting because fasting was prescribed in the second year of hijrah in Mecca, they did not fast when they were in Mecca. There were no fasting. Neither there were formal prayers in Mecca. There were no formal prayers, five daily prayers. When they came to Medina, prayers was established after 17 months. Prayers was established, and in the second year of Hijrah, the fasting was prescribed upon them. So they have just started fasting, and after eight years of the beginning of their fast, the Prophet, eight days, sorry, the Prophet is asking them to go with him to the battlefield, which is about 100 and kilometers, 100 and kilometers south of Medina, in a valley called Badr, Wadi Badr. This is why the battle is called Badr, which is named after the valley where the battle took place, Wadi Bad, 150 kilometers south of Medina, and it is north of Mecca. Somewhere, not exactly in between Mecca and Medina, it is closer to Medina than Mecca, because the distance between Mecca and Medina is about 400 kilometers. So the people who went with a prophet they were only 313, 313 soldiers. But they were poorly equipped. Those 313 soldiers, they did not have swords. Many of them were very poor. So they would carry pieces of sticks or the trunks of the palm trees to fight with it. They say the number of the swords were very small. So the army was not really qualified army, trained army, prepared army, well-equipped army. They were volunteers, you know, uh, who were very poor at that time. And even they did not have means of transportation. At that time, means of transportation were horses and camels. So this 313 people, they had only eight horses, only eight hor horses and 70 camels. So they had to take a turn. Some of them would ride the camel, the others would walk, and then they switch. They switch. I believe they lost a lot of weight in this trip. Yeah, good exercise. 
But they did not fast. Because when you travel, you don't fast. When the Prophet left Medina on the eighth day, he broke his fast because this is the ruling in the Quran. When you travel, فَمَنْ كَانَ مِنْكُمْ مَرِيضًا أَوْ عَلَى سَفَرٍ People who are sick, people who are traveling, they are not required to fast. So they were not fasting. But again, they did not have food or weapon with them. So Abu Sufyan, when he realized, Sakhr ibn Har, when he realized that the Prophet brought his community to intercept his caravan, he sent a distress message to the Meccans. He hired someone, he told him to ride the horse, and rush to Mecca and tell the Meccans, your caravan is gone, you lost all your money. And that's a big disaster for the Meccans. To tell them that you lost your money, you know, some people tell them, you lost your life, he doesn't worry. But tell him you lost your money, he worries a lot. Money, for some people, is more important than life, believe me. We see this in every community, at every time. So, this guy came to Mecca and he started yelling. He stood at the Mount Safa, mountain there, where they make the announcements. So if someone stands on this mountain, people gather to see what he says or she says. So he started saying, Oh Meccans, Muhammad confiscated your caravan. All your money is gone. So they all gathered, they were mobilized, and they decided every person in Mecca, every single person, every single male, to carry the weapon and go and fight Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not only men, even women decided, women, the wife of Abu Sufyan who was in Mecca at that time, her name is Hind. Hind bent Utbah, her father is Utbah, and I'm going to tell you what happened to her father soon. You would enjoy what happened to her father. Hind also said, I, I'm not carrying weapon, but I'm, I'm a good cheerleader. Have you seen these cheerleaders, you know, who jump up and down? She wasn't that young. She wasn't 16 or 17 years old, but she was, you know, in her probably 50s, but still she was able to dance, you know. She says, I dedicate myself and my women with me, my sisters, my group, as cheerleaders to entertain the army, the army of Quraysh. We come as entertainers. So they took off from Mecca with 1,000, 1,000 soldiers. Quraysh's army was 1,000 soldiers. The only person who stayed behind was the uncle of the Prophet Abu Lahab. Abu Lahab said, listen, my life is more important than anything else. Let my money go to hell, I don't care. I'm staying in Mecca. They said to him, but you must defend the caravan. He said, okay, I will pay for someone to go. So he paid someone, he hired him to fight on his behalf. So Abu Lahab stayed in Mecca. And so the Prophet realized that the caravan now is gone. Abu Sufyan was smart. He made a, do, uh, uh, a detour. He took a different route and he went to the, there is a route on the Red Sea, another path on the Red Sea. Uh, which is uh, close to the, to the sea, he took another route and he escaped. He avoided Medina because he realized that the Muslim army are going to, to, to seize his caravan, so he managed to escape. But then when he sent this distress message to the Meccans, the Meccans came, though they realized that the caravan now is safe, but out of arrogance, they said, we're going to teach Muhammad a lesson. Muhammad was a barefoot. He had no food to eat. And he was persecuted by us. And he managed to escape from Mecca to Medina. Now he's mobilizing an army to defy us. We will teach him a lesson. Though the caravan is safe, but we will go ahead with the war. So they decided to go all the way all the way to Medina to fight against Muhammad 
and the new established community of the Muslims in Medina. Here the Prophet used to consult his community always. The Prophet was not a dictator. Although we believe in Islam, the Prophet is inspired by God and he is commanded by God. He receives commands from God. But yet the Prophet used to consult to teach us a very important principle and that principle is called the principle of I spoke about it a few days ago. Sure. Consultation. Sure. God says to the Prophet, consult with them in these matters. So the Prophet consulted his community. Would you like to go to the war or not? The community was divided. Some of them did not like to go. Some of them were frightened. If you read the book of Sirah, Sirat ibn Hisham, the book of Al-Maghazi bil-Waqidi, and many other books, that narrates the life of the Prophet, you will find that there were two groups. Some of them were supportive, they wanted to go to war to defend themselves. Others were afraid. Others <coughs> were not in favor of war, neither in favor of defense. One of the people who was not in favor of war was Umar ibn Khattab. He said, Ya Rasulullah, inna ha Quraysh. ما ذلت منذ عزت وما آمنت منذ كفرت. Those people are arrogant. This is Quraysh. Quraysh is undefeatable. Nobody can defeat this superpower in the region. It is a superpower, and we cannot meet with them. We are not equal with them. So it's better to retreat. It's better not to go to war. It's better to stay. So the Prophet said, "Let me listen to others." Others came, came up, al maqdad ibn Aswad, one of the companions, he said, Ya Rasulullah, we follow your instructions. If you tell us to, to go through this sea, we will do so. Wherever you tell us to go, we will come with you. We are not going to be like the community of Moses. When he asked them, to come with him to Palestine, they said to him, Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila inna ha huna qa'idun. Moses, you go and fight alongside your Lord. Let your Lord help you. We are enjoying our time in the Sinai Peninsula. Ha huna qa'idun. But we will say to you, Ya Rasulullah, Idhab anta wa rabbuka faqatila inna ma'akum muqatilun. We will come with you, Ya Rasulullah. We will come. We will listen to you. The same thing happened by another leader, Sa'ad ibn Ma'ath, the leader of the Ansar. Ansar are the inhabitants of Medina, those who received the Prophet when he moved from Mecca to Medina, and they helped him. They are called Ansar, helpers. Sa'ad ibn Ma'ath said, Ya Rasulullah, we are with you. We will fight Quraysh and we will crush them. Those people are arrogant. And if you don't stand up to arrogance, you will be always abused. And God does not want you to be abused. God wants you to defend yourself. Self-defense is important. A good believer is the believer that when he or she is abused, they have to defend themselves. Not just ask Allah, oh Allah help me, oh Allah this guy is abusing me, hurting me, insulting me, do something about it. God says, I will do, but after you do, after you defend yourself, I'll come to your aid. You have to maintain your dignity and your honor and your value. So you have to defend yourself. So the Prophet, when he heard these encouraging statements from some of his companions, he said to them, Abshiru, I'm giving you glad tidings. فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ تَعَالَى وَعَدَنِي إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ My Lord has just promised me that we're going to score one of these two victories. Either we're going to seize their caravan or we're going to defeat them in the battle. وَإِذْ يَعِدُكُمُ اللَّهُ إِحْدَى الطَّائِفَتَيْنِ Now, some still 
Some of them still were reluctant, and this is mentioned in the Quran. If you want to know the details of this, of this military excursion, read the Quran, please. And I said many times, in the month of Ramadan, we are asked to read the Quran, but not just reading with no understanding. It has no value, no merits. You have to read and understand the translation and understand the background. Why this verse has been revealed, for what reason, and what does it mean? Once you understand the reason, you understand the recitation. The recitation is going to be very capturing, very interesting. But if you don't understand the meaning, you are wasting your time. And I said, you don't have, some people say, you have to finish the whole Quran. Yes, people who understand Arabic, they can finish the Holy Quran. People who, who, whose Arabic is well, excellent, they can understand the Quran and they can finish, let's say, one cycle, two cycles, three cycles. But those who do not understand Arabic, you don't have to finish the whole Quran. Allah knows about your ability. Allah knows your mother tongue is not Arabic. You need to translate, you need to understand, you need to take your time. So you don't have to finish the whole Quran without understanding. Even if you read one section, one juzuk, with understanding, that would be more beneficial than reading the whole Quran without understanding. And I say this all the time. Read the Quran, read one page, read the three lines, but try to understand it. Don't bypass it without knowing what does this. This is a treasure, believe me. One verse, it might take three, four hours of your time to reflect on it. This is a book of reflection, a book of meditation. So we should, we should respect the book and give it the value that it deserves. By just reading it without understanding the meaning, what do you understand? What do you enjoy? There is no enjoyment. So here, Allah says to the Prophet in Surah Al-Anfal, chapter 8, verse 5 and 6. Read these verses whenever you make time. كَمَا أَخْرَجَكَ رَبُّكَ مِنْ بَيْتِكَ بِالْحَقِّ وَإِنَّ فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ لَكَارِهُونَ God took you off of your house, O Muhammad, from Medina, to go and combat Quraysh, while a group of the believers with you were averse to this. They were reluctant to come with you. Lakarihun. You know the meaning of Lakarihun? How many of you know the meaning of Karihun? Raise your hand. Karihun from Kurh, when you don't like something. Allah is saying that the group of believers with you, they were averse. They were reluctant to come with you. They didn't want to come with you. I want you to understand the community of the Prophet. Sometimes we believe all of them were angels, but this is not the case. The Quran tells us the facts. Some of them, the Prophet is asking them, come with me. Come to help defend your community, your family. They say, no, leave me alone. Not only they don't like and, and they're reluctant, but they are disputing with you. يجادلون from Jidal. يجادلونك في الحق بعد ما تبين. They dispute with you regarding the truth when the truth is very obvious to them. They know what is right and what is wrong. Despite that, they dispute with you. Despite knowing what is right and what is wrong, they keep, like some children sometimes, you know? Yeah. Children, they know what is good and what is bad, but still they argue with their parents. Argue. يُجَادِلُونَكَ فِي الْحَقِّ بَعْدَمَا تَبَيَّنْ كَأَنَّمَا يُسَاقُونَ إِلَى الْمَوْتِ وَهُمْ يَنْظُرُونَ They were so afraid to go with the Prophet as if they've been driven to a slaughterhouse. Someone wanted to slaughter them. They were too afraid. This is the wording of the Qur'an, Surah Al-Anfal. Read the Qur'an and reflect on the book. The Prophet himself, he didn't want to fight. He was not a warmonger. He did not want to shed the blood of people. But that is his last resort. Last resort. 
with the enemy who does not understand logic, with the enemy who keeps persecuting you, okay, and threatening you, and taking everything away from you, and leaving you with no choice, then you must stand up to that enemy. You must defend yourself. So the Prophet had to go out of necessity to defend his community and his people. So they arrived, long story, make it short, they arrived to the battlefield, and here in the morning of the 17th of Ramadan, like today, the two army, they confronted each other. One army, 1,000 soldiers, the other army, 313 soldiers. The Prophet raised his hand to his Lord. He said, Allahumma in tahlak hadihil isabah falan tu'bada fil ard. Oh my Lord, I'm doing everything I can. I'm defending my community. I'm bringing my men, though they are poor and needy and they have no weapon, but we are standing to defeat those barbaric people, those aggressors. But my Lord, if those people are going to die today, the 313, no one is going to worship you on earth. That is the end of monothe monotheism, the end of worshiping God. Because those people are idol worshippers and aggressors. And they're going to wreak havoc in the land. So if this group, 313, are going to perish, فَلَنْ تُعْبَدَ فِي الْأَرْضِ No one is going to recognize you and worship you. So I leave the case to you. This is my last resort. And this is what we should do. When we have a problem, when we face something important, you do what you can, you do everything you can, and leave the rest to God. Assign the case to Him. Tell Him the case now is in your court. I did whatever I, I was able to do. And here the two armies, they confront each other. Three arrogant men from this side, Quraysh side, they come out carrying their swords, and they said, Muhammad, bring us our counterparts, akfa'ana min qawmina. Bring us, we are heroes, so we need to see the heroes from your sides. They were saying that sarcastically, so we teach them a lesson. Those three were two brothers, Utbah ibn Shayba, uh, Utbah, sorry, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah, Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah is the father of Hind, Hind, the cheerleaders, the mother of Muawiyah. Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. Her uncle, Shayba ibn Rabi'ah, two brothers, Utbah and Shayba. Those were the leaders of pagans, the most arrogant in Mecca. The most arrogant. And the son of Utbah, Al-Walid ibn Utbah, who is the uncle of, the brother of Hind, and the uncle of whom? Muawiyah ibn Abi Suhaib. So those are three leaders, Utbah, Shayba, Walid. Make them short so you memorize the names. Utbah and Shayba and Walid. They came, the Prophet asked three heroes. The first hero, Ali ibn Abi Talib, alayhi salatu wassalam. 24 years old, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And then the uncle of the Prophet, Al Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib, alayhi salam. Sayyid al Shuhada. And then another companion by the name of Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, they were engaged in the combat. Immediately Imam Ali wasted no time. Suddenly you, you saw a head pops, pops out in the sky with the sword of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Imam Ali puts an end to Al-Walid, is the uncle Hamza ibn Abd al-Muttalib. He puts an end to Shayba. But Utbah, Utbah was, you know, was able to strike on Ubaidah ibn al-Harith, the Muslim companion. He wanted him, but then Imam Ali and Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib came to his aid, and they were able to put down Utbah ibn Rabi'ah. So three of them were killed, the casualties, three from this side, and a wounded companion of the Prophet who later on died because of his bleeding. 
And then the two armies, they clashed with each other for a few hours. The result was 70 people were murdered from Quraysh, another 70 were taken as captives, and the rest of the army ran away from the battlefield. The army of Mushrikeen run away and flee from the battle with the help of God. How was the help of God? Here God, when Muslims were outnumbered by the polytheists, the pagans, God interfered here. How did he interfere? Look at what the book says. The book says, إِذْ يُرِيكَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنَامِكَ قَلِيلًا وَلَوْ أَرَاكَهُمْ كَثِيرًا لَفَشِلْتُمْ وَلَتَنَازَعْتُمْ فِي الْأَمْرُ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ سَلَّمَ إِنَّهُ عَلِيمٌ لِذَاتِ الصُّدُورِ وَإِذْ يُرِيكُهُمُ إِذْ التَّقَيْتُمْ فِي أَعْيُنِكُمْ قَلِيلًا وَيُقَلِّلُكُمْ فِي أَعْيُنِهِمْ لِيَقْضِيَ اللَّهُ أَمْرًا كَانَ مَفْعُولًا What happened? Allah says in the Quran that we made the Muslims see the non-Muslim army as a few. So when they are a few, you will have more courage to go and defeat them. But if you see them as a huge army, then you will be afraid. It will be a, a big army for you. So you will be reluctant to go. So God made Quraysh army look few in the eyes of the Muslim army. So the Muslims will be more encouraged. They will look at them as an easy target. When you look at enemy as an easy target, you'll have more encouragement to go and confront your enemy. At the same time, God made the Muslims also look very few and small in the eyes of the pagans' army. Why? Not for the same reason, for another reason. So they can be arrogant and they will say, hey, I don't prepare for them. This few number needs no preparation. So they will go to the war relaxed and prepared and lazy. And this is what happened. But this is in the beginning of the, of the clashing. Later on in chapter 3, Allah says, when, when they came, because if they had seen the Muslim army as a huge army, they wouldn't have gone. So Allah made them to see the Muslim army only in the beginning as a small army. So they will go for confrontation. They will go for confrontation with them. As soon as the war started, Allah made the Muslim army looks twice as much in the eyes of Quraysh. So they could not continue the fighting. Do you follow me on this or not? This is all mentioned in the Quran. Where does it say that when they started the fight, God made the Muslim army as it was, as twice, as twice, as much? Where is it? In Surat Al Imran, Yarawnahum Mithlayhim Ra'yal Ain. Yarawnahum Mithlayhim Ra'yal Ain. Chapter 3, verse 13. So they were exhausted. They were fighting them. All of a sudden, this army that looked a few minutes ago, it looked very small now. It looks very huge. We cannot defeat them. So they were very exhausted and tired. They could not continue fighting. And this is why they run away. They were defeated. And Allah says another reason for Quraysh defeat, we cast fear in their hearts. This is the work of God. So ulqi, God says, so ulqi, I will cast fear. So ulqi fi qulub al-ladhina kafaru al-ru'. So ulqi fi qulub al-ladhina, I will cast fear in the heart. This is when God interferes. See, God does not send you an airplane or a tank or a rifle. God has his own ways, his own psychological and spiritual ways of either defeating a wicked army or giving victory to another army. He has his ways. So they were defeated because of their fear. Though they had a bigger number, well equipped, 
and they knew they were good fighters, they were trained, but they broke down because God said, I will cast in their hearts and their spirits fear. So, however, let me end with this. When the war ended, unfortunately, some of the Muslims were fighting with each other over what? Over the booties, over the war spoils. Some of them were saying, these are for us because we were fighting. The other said, no, it is for us because we were protecting the Prophet. The third one said, no, this was for us because we are the old generation. The fourth one said, we are the young generation. We work harder. And you can find this in the beginning, the very beginning of chapter 8, Surah Al-Anfal. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَنْفَالِ Anfal means the war spoils. قُلِ الْأَنْفَالُ لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ وَأَصْلِحُوا ذَاتَ بَيْنِكُمْ Fear God and make good and mend your relationships among yourselves. Respect each other. Respect the rights of each other. But the Prophet ﷺ was there and he said, leave this issue for me because the God, God was asking them, وَأَطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ Listen to what the Prophet says, because what he says, it's on behalf of God. No one is going to be abused. Everyone is going to take his or her share. وصلى الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين.